The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash FFU860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello and welcome to the session about HER2 and HER3 alterations as therapeutic targets of increasing significance in solid tumors. These are today's faculty. I'm Kurt Schalper. I'm a pathologist from Yale University. And Dr. Shanu Modi, she is a breast oncologist and researcher for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. So the session of today will discuss um, a number of topics, starting with uh, basic biology about HER2 and HER3 alterations in cancer. Then we'll move over to discuss the current HER2 and HER3 therapeutic landscape for solid tumors focusing on breast and gastroesophageal cancer. Then we'll move on to the, discuss the diagnostic consideration of HER2 and HER3 in the clinical practice, and we'll end up with a Q&A session and critical discussion points, uh, with then a brief closing. So we'll first discuss the HER2 and HER3 alterations um, across cancers. The HER2, uh, HER family receptors is comprised of four major um, tyrosine kinase molecules, including EGFR, HER2, HER3, and HER4. Altogether, these receptors have alterations in about 10% of human cancers. And whenever they're altered, they tend to um, produce aberrant intracellular signaling, usually through the PI3 kinase and MAP kinase pathway, to ultimately drive uh, cell proliferation and tumor growth. One interesting structure about this family of receptors is that they share a common um, general structure with a long extracellular domain a short hydrophobic transmembrane domain, and an intracellular domain which is enriched in tyrosine kinase residue that can be phosphorylated to enhance intracellular signaling. Relative to the ligands of these receptors, um, there are multiple ligands described for EGFR, which are indicated in the table, but also for HER3 and HER4. Surprisingly, there are no ligands recognized for HER2, um, which is at this point uh, making it an orphan receptor. HER2 can have multiple types of alterations across tumors. Um, and in this case, uh, we have summarized uh, most of the alterations across major solid uh, tumor types. One important thing is that HER2 amplification is one of the major uh, molecular alterations, which is particularly high in breast and gastroesophageal cancers. However, HER2 can also have deleterious mutations that can happen in about five or less than 5% of cases. Um, and the one of them, it's bladder cancer that shows a relatively high frequency of mutations. So essentially, it can happen in multiple ways. Another interesting aspect about HER2 is that it can be pretty dynamic. Um, and there have been studies showing that, at least in gastroesophageal cancer patients, alterations in EGFR can change after treatment. Uh, and not only that, additional um, mutations or commutations can appear that may drive oncogenesis in this setting. So essentially, the alterations are not set and can be uh, changed after therapeutic interventions. HER3, on the other hand, um, is a slightly different molecule in that it's expected to have an inactive kinase domain, at least when it's in a homomeric or individual state, um, and, and the expected mechanism of action is actually through heterodimerization, predominantly with EGFR and HER2, which uh, essentially increases the autophosphorylation and can mediate intracellular signaling activation. As opposed to other members of the family, uh, alterations in HER3 are a little bit less characterized. However, there have been uh, reports showing that a fraction of human solid tumors can have HER3 amplification, as you can see on the table, particularly esophage esophageal gastric malignancies, um, and some others, uh, but there is also uh, reports of HER3 mutations uh, that can happen at a relatively low frequency, but have also been described. One of the most important things about HER2 and HER3 is that there are currently multiple options to potentially target these therapies uh, in the context of frontline and second-line treatment and also third-line treatment, uh, but this has been rapidly expanding over the last years, uh, and we'll review that in more detail next. So with that, um, I'll uh, give segue to Dr. Shanu Modi uh, to take over uh, the next section.
Thanks, Kurt. So moving now into the clinical arena, the HER2 story is one of the great success stories of molecularly targeted therapy. And it started with the discovery of the HER2 oncogene in the 80s, and this was followed by the approval of the first HER2 targeted agent, trastuzumab, approximately 20 years later. And if we fast forward to the present time, we now have eight approved targeted therapies for this subtype of breast cancer. And if we look at the clinical impact this has had on the lives of patients, today we're seeing a near doubling of the survival rates for patients with advanced stages of HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer, which is a tremendous achievement. So uh, here is our current algorithm for the treatment of patients in the metastatic setting. And the preferred first-line regimen is a combination of a taxane plus dual HER2 blockade with trastuzumab and pertuzumab. In the second line, we prefer to use the HER2 antibody drug conjugate, adotrastuzumab m and also called TDM1. And beyond that, there are multiple options to, to select from, all of which have very modest activity, so no one preferred standard of care. And this setting is also the setting for which there has been a tremendous amount of activity dedicated to discovering new and active therapies for these refractory patients. So this past year, literally in a span of 12 months, we saw the approval of four new HER2 targeted agents, essentially doubling the armamentarium. Uh, and so now we have a new HER2 ADC, two more TKIs, and a novel HER2 monoclonal antibody. So let's review the pivotal data that led to these exciting new treatments for our refractory patients. And starting with the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you know that these are small molecules that inhibit the internal tyrosine kinase domain of her family receptors and thereby block downstream signaling cascades. There are in fact a number of TKIs in development as shown in the chart. Now, lapatinib, which is a reversible HER1 and HER2 TKI, has been available for many years, but has very modest activity. Tucadnib, on the other hand, is a new and unique tyrosine kinase inhibitor in that it selectively inhibits HER2. And by sparing HER1 in particular, it's associated with less GI and skin toxicity. So the HER2 CLIMB study was the pivotal randomized phase two trial of tecatinib and it enrolled patients with refractory HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer who had had the prior uh, treatments with trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and TDM1 and randomized these patients to standard of care capecitabine plus trastuzumab or capecitabine plus trastuzumab and tecatinib. Now this study met both its primary and secondary endpoints. On the left, you can see there was a 50% decrease in the risk of progression with tucatinib therapy. And on the right is overall survival. And there was a median improvement from 17 months to 22 months. And that's an absolute gain of four and a half months. So a very positive trial with impressive uh, randomized efficacy data. Now, one of the... Uh, Pardon me. One of the, one of the unique, um, features of, of the HER2 CLIMB study is that it did enroll patients with active brain metastases. Now, this is a group that's usually excluded from our systemic therapy trials. And so shown here on the left, tucatinib doubled the response rate in active CNS metastases. And on the top right, you see a 65% decrease in the risk of progression in the brain. Similarly, on the bottom right, there's a 50% decrease in the risk of death or a doubling of survival for patients who have active brain mets on the tucatinib arm. So this is an exceptionally active therapy for both systemic and intracranial disease. Now, the other TKI approved this past year was neratinib, and unlike tucatinib, neratinib is an irreversible pan-her family kinase inhibitor, so it has the potential for a more potent and complete HER2 blockade, but also more GI toxicity as a result. The pivotal study for neratinib was called NALA, and this is, again, for HER2-positive patients who were randomized either to standard of care lapatinib plus capecitabine or neratinib plus capecitabine. On the left, you can see there was a statistically significant 2.2 month absolute improvement in progression-free survival in favor of neratinib, making this a positive trial. Unfortunately, there was no statistical improvement in overall survival, which is a very different outcome than we saw with tucatinib. A key secondary endpoint was to look at CNS benefits of neratinib, and overall there was less need for brain radiation and a lower incidence of new brain mets on the neratinib arm, which is consistent with what we know to be its, its, its benefits for the CNS compartment. 
Perhaps a more active option for our pretreated patients is the novel HER2 antibody drug conjugate called trastuzumab deroxtecan, or TDXD for short. Now briefly, antibody drug conjugates are comprised of a monoclonal antibody and linked to this is a cytotoxic payload. When the antibody binds its target antigen, the whole complex is internalized and the chemo is cleaved off, allowing it to kill the cancer cell. In some ADCs, the chemo is able to permeate the cell membrane and then it can enter and kill neighboring cells as well, even those that may not harbor the target antigen. And this is what we call the bystander effect. So to compare TDXD to TDM1, they both have trastuzumab essentially as their monoclonal antibody backbone, but TDXD has a novel cytotoxic payload, which is a TOPA1 inhibitor. It also has twice as many chemo molecules per antibody, and the chemo is membrane permeable, so it can exert that bystander effect. I think overall, TDXD has some improved pharmaceutical properties compared to TDM1. Now, the pivotal study for TDXD was called Destiny Breast 01, and this was a phase two trial, not a randomized study. Overall, 184 patients were treated at the recommended phase two dose. And as you can see, this was a very heavily pretreated group of patients having a median of six lines of prior treatment. The primary endpoint of the study was response rate. And here with over 20 months of follow-up, the objective confirmed uh, independently reviewed response rate was 61%. And I think the waterfall plot very dramatically shows you that almost every patient who enrolled on this trial had some degree of tumor regression. Uh, And and this was highly durable as well with a median duration of response of 21 months and a progression-free survival of 19 months. These are truly unprecedented efficacy results for such a heavily pretreated group of patients Not at all what we would expect for patients in the six-line setting. So this is really exciting data for this new ADC. The follow-up randomized studies, uh, phase three studies of trastuzumab drexican have already finished enrollment. Those are Destiny Breast 02 and 03, and we hope to hear results from these later this year. Finally, the most recently approved HER2-targeted agent is margituximab. Now, this is a HER2 monoclone antibody, much like trastuzumab, But the FC domain has been engineered to have greater binding affinity to the activating CD16 receptor on immune cells. And this is shown here. So uh, HER2 binds its target, pardon me, HER2 trastuzumab binds its, or the margituximab binds its uh, HER2 target. And then the FC domain attaches to the CD16A activating receptor on immune cells. So this um, antibody has the potential for a much more vigorous immune response against the tumors. Now, genetically, a majority of the population, about 85% of us, have a naturally low binding or low affinity CD16 receptor genotype by virtue of having an F allele. And these are the patients you would expect to see a greater benefit from margituximab versus trastuzumab. So the SOFIA trial was the pivotal randomized phase three study, again, for refractory HER2 patients who received either standard of care chemo plus trastuzumab or chemo plus margituximab. And as shown here, there was a 24% decrease in the risk of progression in favor of margituximab. However, this translated to a very modest 0.9 month absolute improvement. And while the clinical significance of this result has been heavily debated, Nonetheless, this is a statistically positive result. Uh, Mature overall survival data are still pending. I think what was most interesting to me was the exploratory analysis where they looked at efficacy based on genotype for that CD16A receptor, and it did show that there was more more pronounced benefit for margituximab in the F allele carrying patients. So coming back to our treatment algorithm, This is the 2021, I think, treatment approach to HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer, incorporating the new agents based on their unique strengths and activity profiles. And, you know, speaking as a clinician, I think it's very exciting to have so many strong options for our refractory patients. And, of course, we hope that these new therapies will allow us to continue to build and improve upon the long-term survival outcomes for these advanced stage patients. Now, outside of breast cancer, gastric cancer is the other tumor type where targeting HER2 has had a clinical impact. The TOGA trial was the landmark first-line study, which showed that adding trastuzumab to chemo versus chemo alone improved survival for patients with advanced stage HER2-positive gastric and GE junction cancers and really set a new standard of care. In an attempt to replicate the success of dual blockade that was seen in breast cancer, the follow-up trial, Jacob, 
randomize HER2 positive gastric patients to chemo plus trastuzumab or chemo plus trastuzumab and pertuzumab, but unfortunately, this trial did not meet statistical significance. In fact, there have been multiple negative clinical trials of HER2 targeted therapy in gastric cancer since the TOGA trial. Now, this lack of benefit has been attributed to several factors, but largely attributed to the heterogeneity of HER2 expression in gastric cancer and the loss of HER2 expression that's commonly seen in gastric cancers post-trastuzumab therapy, which is something we don't see in breast cancer. Given its improved pharmaceutical properties, the new HER2 antibody drug conjugate, TDXD, was also evaluated in gastric cancer patients post-trastuzumab and patients who were still HER2 positive. This was the Destiny Gastric 01 study, and it randomized patients to either standard of care chemo or uh, TDXD. And unlike the prior negative trials in this space, TDXD was significantly superior to chemo alone in these trastuzumab refractory patients, improving the response rate and duration of response by threefold and an almost four month absolute gain in overall survival. And based on these um, dramatic results, uh, TDXD is now the second approved HER2 targeted agent for gastric cancer and GE junction cancers just this past January. Looking briefly at other cancer types, there have been several studies of dual HER2 blockade and HER2 positive colorectal cancer, which have shown some impressive activity, uh, including trastuzumab plus lapatinib combinations and trastuzumab plus pertuzumab combinations. Importantly, the success of HER2 agents in colorectal cancer does depend on a second biomarker, that being RAS. In the My Pathway trial, for example, all the responses were seen in the RAS wild type HER2 positive patients, none in the RAS mutated cancers. In non small cell lung cancer, there are a number of alterations of HER2 amplification, overexpression, and mutations. However, there is a lack of correlation amongst these, and it's unclear uh, what the prognostic significance of these alterations are. So this actually may explain why the original or the early initial studies of HER2-targeted therapy in lung cancer were negative. In fact, thus far, HER2-targeted therapies in lung cancer have been active only for patients with HER2-mutated cancers. And as shown here, newer generation TKIs like poziotinib have produced some compelling responses in this group of patients. Um, also, the HER2 antibody drug conjugate, again, trastuzumab deruxacan, has shown strong activity uh, in the Destiny Lung 01 trial in the HER2 mutated cohort of patients, that's cohort two, with an impressive response rate of 61% and a PFS of 14 months. So while HER2 breast cancer has been a model tumor type for HER2 targeted therapeutics, we are now starting to see other cancer types replicate this success, particularly with the newer generation of HER2 targeted agents. Moving on, HER3, uh, as we heard, is also an emerging clinically relevant biomarker, and, and we heard testing, of course, has not been well standardized. Uh, expression levels have been variable across trials and tumor types, but the receptor does play an important role as a potent dimerization partner with other HER family members, and it is associated with resistance to therapy and poor survival outcomes. One of the exciting agents in development is a novel HER3 antibody drug conjugate called U3-1402. It is very similar to TDXD as they have the same linker payload technology with the cytotoxin being a topo isomerase 1 inhibitor. In a phase 1 trial of U3-1402, there was impressive activity seen for refractory HER3 positive metastatic breast cancer of all subtypes for an overall response rate of 43%. And in a dedicated phase one study for non-small cell lung cancer, where the vast majority of patients with EGFR mutated cancers have HER3 expression, the overall response rate was 25%. There are now a number of ongoing phase two studies with this exciting HER3 ADC already underway in several different tumor types. And I think this is an emerging space in cancer therapy that we need to watch uh, closely. So stay tuned. Uh, I'll now pass uh, the platform back over to Kurt to talk about diagnostic considerations in, in HER2 and HER3. Great, thank you very much. So, so now as we have seen the, the clinical landscape have been very active, but so has been the diagnostic landscape. Um, and one of the uh, major um, advantages and challenges at the same time uh, is the multiple uh, availability of platforms that can be used to detect alterations, and in this case in HER2, but also to some extent in HER3. Uh, and these are the three most traditionally used tools, which is immunohistochemistry, 
um, fluorescence in situ hybridization, which is as also a non-fluorescent version. But now we also have next generation sequencing, which is also able to capture some of these alterations. The good thing about multiple testing tools is that we can do sequential testing and that way we capture most of the patients that have that favorable biology for treatment. But the downside of having multiple testings is that we can have discordance between them. Um, and that has triggered a number of guidelines over the years to try to deal with those cases that may be ambiguous or may be positive for one and negative for other. Ultimately, the goal is to combine the power of multiple tools to be able to give the most benefit to the patients. So in breast cancer, this has been a very active field and we have seen a number of uh, guidelines coming from ASCO and CAP. Uh, but one of the uh, current uh, most accepted uh, algorithm is the one that I'm showing here, where essentially uh, every patient gets tested uh, and first evaluated by immunohistochemistry. The evaluation by immunohistochemistry at this point is done under light microscopy by a pathologist, and there are two sort of major ends uh, of possible results. One that it's indicated on the left, which is the positive result, which is essentially when there is intense membrane staining, complete membrane staining in more than 10% of tumor cell, that's a clear positive. Uh, and then we have the other end, which are the negative cases in which essentially there is no staining whatsoever or diffuse um, barely apparent staining in less than 10% of cells. Uh, then we have these uh, negative uh, cases that are one plus, uh, and then IHC2 or equivocal, which have some expression in more than 10% of cells, but it's not strong enough to be called uh, positive. And we'll touch more about these uh, equivocal categories. So uh, in general, as I mentioned, the, the first pass is to do immunohistochemistry, and then in, in the both extremes, positive and negative, it's okay to just move like that. But then in the intermediate categories, it's recommended to do fish testing or immune, um, uh, in situ hybridization. Uh, in the last update of the ASCO CAP guidelines for breast cancer, there were a few changes relative to this. The first one, uh, which essentially eliminated the category of, of uh, cases equivocal when they have less than 10% of cells, and now they only call equivocal those cases with more than 10%, and this was to avoid confusion among uh, pathologists. Uh, and then also, there was a recommendation that if the initial HER2 test in a core needle biopsy is negative, they may repeat the test once a larger specimen becomes available. And this is essentially to try to avoid false negatives from small biopsies and pick them up at the resection specimen. Then three recommendations were added to deal with these cases that have intermediate categories. So essentially they fit some criteria for the fish, in this case more than two, uh, 2.0 uh, ratio of HER2 to CEP17 signals, but less than four individual HER2 copies. And then the cases that had more than six copies, but less than 2.0 ratio. So essentially these are intermediate categories that I will also expand on a little bit later. So when we think about the IHC scoring, uh, it's as indicated in the slide where we have again these extremes, the, the category zero or negative, where there is essentially no chromogenic signal detected in any tumor cell. And then we have the three plus where the majority of cells have this very bright, intense, complete membrane staining. And then examples of the intermediate categories are presented there with the one plus being essentially very mild, barely detectable signal in focal cells. And then we have the two plus, which is probably the most difficult in which there is staining in more than 10% of cells, but it's not really intense um, and marked as shown in the three plus. So now the, the definition to be able to uh, use the in situ hybridization methods, and, and they typically com compose of the dual probe with the HER2 and the chromosome 17 centromeric probe, at this point, again, classifies them into these two extremes. So first, the, the real true positive cases, which typically have a ratio of HER2 to CEP17 more than two, and also they have more than four individual copies of HER2. So those cases are positive and they stay like that. And then we have the other extreme on the right, which are the negative cases, in which essentially there is a lower than two um, HER2 to CEP17 ratio, and also less than 4.0 um, individual copies of HER2. So these cases again are clear. However, now um, after the last revision, there are these three categories, group two, three, and four, in which there may be relative discordances between the, the ratio and the number, absolute number of HER2 copies. And in these cases, essentially the recommendation is to do additional IHC testing of the same blocks and to analyze and interpret them um, in, in the same context or concurrently. 
These are examples of cases that are prototypical for HER2 scoring by dual probe fish. And you can see on the left uh, a diploid case where there are two centromeric probes and two HER2. So essentially there's a ratio of one, <clears throat> no alteration. And then you have another case that is not amplified in the center when there are multiple copies of HER2, but also multiple copies of the centromeric probe. So essentially the ratio here will not be above two. And then we have a real amplified case on the right where you can see <clears throat> only two centromeric green probes indicating diploid genome, but then multiple red copies of HER2 indicating an increased number and ratio. So now there is also approval and recommendation for potential use of uh, HER2 only in cyto hybridization, so essentially using only the HER2 probes. Uh, and they are, are stratified as indicated here, where we have essentially two ends. The positive cases, which have more than six individual copies of the HER2 gene on the uh, chromogenic in cyto hybridization. And then you have the negative, which are the ones that have less than four. However, again, we have an intermediate category when they have between four and six. And the recommendation is to test these cases further using orthogonal approaches such as immunohistochemistry or dual probe fish. One very interesting topic that has emerged mostly from clinical trial results is that there may be an emerging category of cases uh, that are the so-called HER2 low. Uh, so traditionally, we report the cases as being HER2 positive or HER2 negative. But now there is an increasing view that cases with relatively low expression, typically qualifying as negative now, should be potentially considered as HER2 low because there may be clinical benefit um, from targeting HER2 in this population. And as you can see on the right side, this population is actually quite sizable with about half of the cases in, in breast cancer and, and similar fra fractions in other tumor types. So now in gastric cancer, there have also been developments essentially after a TOCA trial. Um, and one of the things that are a little bit different from what we have learned in breast cancer is that as opposed to breast cancer, the staining and the presence of HER2 alterations in gastroesophageal tumors tends to be more heterogeneous. And this poses a challenge for scoring when we are looking at areas that may be positive and areas that may be not. Another important point is that there is an increased possibility of false negative staining, usually as a consequence of this heterogeneity. So the current recommendation is to try to test more than one specimen or multiple areas from the specimen that it's available. Another important difference is that as opposed um, to luminal cells in breast cancer, the foveolar cells of the gastric epithelium, they lack typically expression in the luminal surface. So essentially, in uh, gastroesophageal lesions, the, the HER2 staining is not scored in the top of the cells, but only on the lateral membrane. So essentially, complete membrane staining is not required to call this positive. And this is the current recommended algorithm for testing um, gastroesophageal tumors for HER2, where essentially is a very similar approach. The, the testing starts with immunohistochemistry, um, and when the patients are deemed positive, they essentially get the treatment if, if clinically recommended, and when they're negative, they don't get the treatment. However, there are again this IHC 1 plus and 2 intermediate categories where the recommendation is to actually test further using, <clears throat> um, in this case, fish or in situ hybridization. The current scoring guidelines for HER2 testing are the ones essentially modified after the TOGA trial by Hoffman et al. Um, and they are very similar to lung with the difference that we already mentioned. So we have a negative category with less than 10% of cells with or no reactivity. Then we have the 1 plus category in which there is faint staining in more than 10% of cells. The 2 plus category or equivocal where there is weak to moderate staining in more than 10% of cells. And then you have the true positives in which there is strong complete basolateral or lateral membranous reactivity in more than 10% of cells. And to visualize this, we have a few examples. You can see here a, a negative case where there is a lot of chromogenic signal, but the signal is certainly cytoplasmic and even nuclear, so no membranous staining should be called negative. And then you have examples of a 1 plus where there is faint staining in more than 10% of cells, but certainly not complete and not very strong. These are examples of equivalent, equivocal cases where we see uh, more than 10% of cells showing membranous staining, but the staining is not very intense. And as you can see, there is quite a bit of uh, cytoplasmic staining. And then finally, we have the, the true positive cases, which are this very, very boldly stained um, tumor cells in more than 10%. Uh, and generally, these cases have staining um, in the majority of the lesions. 
So a couple of things relative to the um, gastroesophageal staining. First, uh, it's important that, as I mentioned, it's recommended to stain first with immunohistochemistry and then subsequently, if necessary, with fish. Um, and the positivity um, scores are indicated in there. Uh, and then relative to the method of staining, uh, as similar as in breast cancer, there is the possibility to use uh, fluorescence, dual probe methods, or single uh, base chromogenic uh, methods that can be assessed in light microscopy and sometimes enhance the morphology visualization. One interesting discussion that has been ongoing is what and how to test patients with gastric cancer. And after the TCGA project, it was very clear that there are four major molecular subtypes of, of gastric adenocarcinomas, um, and each of them seem to have enrichment for certain molecular alterations. For example, we have the Epstein-Barr virus associated, which generally express PD-L1, and they tend to be more sensitive to immunotherapy. But then there is the microsatellite instability high, which can have a high expression of HER3, uh, but also PD-1, uh, PD-L1 expression. Then we have the genomically stable type of tumors, which generally lack expression of these HER molecules or PD-L1. And then we have the ones that have chromosomic instability, or CIN, that typically accumulate the largest fraction of HER2 positive. So based on this molecular classification, um, some people are proposing to ge generally use panels to text reflex every patient with gastric cancer using uh, this four marker panel with HER2 mismatch repair deficiency, so essentially four uh, marker IHC to call microsatellite instability, and then PDL1 and Epstein Barr. And with these four markers, we would be able to allocate clinically most of the patients. Another topic that has not been resolved is what method to use, particularly in the context of next generation sequencing being more and more available. At this point, there is no FDA approval for testing HER2 using next generation sequencing. However, um, it's becoming more and more uh, clinically used and it has the major advantage that can detect both copy number alterations and mutations at the same time. And not only that, it can detect mutations in multiple uh, genes at the same time. Um, so it takes a little bit longer and it's more expensive and complicated, but it's expected that next generation sequencing will be more and more used um, in the clinical context and may help resolve cases or uh, find uh, HER2 and HER3 alterations in patients that we didn't anticipate. Another um, clinical development and diagnostic development is the expansion in the use of circulating tumor DNA to detect these alterations. At this point, mostly ctDNA is not being used for diagnostic purpose, but mostly to follow up patients over treatment. Um, and as you can see in this slide, has been shown, in this case in gastric cancer, that there is change in clonality that can be detected in circulating tumor DNA just by uh, taking a blood sample. And those molecular alterations, in this case in, with HER2 amplification shown in yellow, are actually very corresponding with the CT scans of the patient's uh, response assessment. So essentially, it's anticipated that um, circulating tumor DNA will favor monitoring. And this is another example where uh, essentially um, HER2 amplification was lost after uh, responsive, but then additional molecular alterations emerged. So in this case, ctDNA could not only be used to follow up the alteration in HER2 in this case, but it could also detect additional alteration that could potentially be targeted. So with that, we're going to move to the next section uh, in which we're going to address um, question and answers and critical discussions points in the field. And one such discussion point that we already touched on is the heterogeneity of HER2 testing and potentially HER3. Um, and what we believe when we say heterogeneity are essentially cases that show um, unhomogeneous populations with areas of cells that may have HER2 um, increase and areas that not. Uh, and this can be actually genetically mediated and potentially non-genomically mediated. Um, these are complex cases that generally are difficult to score. Um, and this is one example of such cases where you can see in a gastroesophageal carcinoma, one area that it's very highly positive, consistent with a 3-plus score, and some areas in the same tissue fragment that actually would not qualify as such. So essentially, there are multiple ways of dealing with this. At this point, orthogonal testing with different methods is one way, but also trying to increase the number of samples that are tested and even samples longitudinally. So this is a way of dealing with heterogeneity. Another um, topic that has been of interest is the use of different antibodies to recognize HER2. Um, and clinically, most labs use um, antibodies that recognize the intracellular domain of HER2, like CB11 or 4D5. 
However, there are some labs uh, that use uh, antibodies that detect only the extracellular domain, um, such as SP3. And this is important because HER2 has been reported to be able to cleave the extracellular domain as a way of inducing resistance to treatment, particularly trastuzumab and things that bind the extracellular domain. This is a study from our group where we measured actually with multiplex fluorescence cases with intracellular and extracellular domain of HER2. And we were able to see in a, ret in a trial, in a small trial from a Hellenic cooperative group, that about 15% of cases actually can have discordant uh, detection between extracellular and intracellular domain. And that actually those cases with uh, presence of intracellular but absence of extracellular domain do worse after adjuvant treatment with trastuzumab, supporting that the antibody that it's used uh, for recognizing and diagnosing is also relevant. So with that, um, I will move next to um, Shanu to discuss the other clinical uh, critical problems. Yeah. So, so thanks, Kurt. I think as a clinician, cl clinician, one of the very exciting clinical applications of HER2 therapy that is newly evolving is the role of HER2 agents beyond HER2 positive disease. And the new generation of HER2 targeted therapies we are seeing are so potent and active and unique uh, with unique mechanisms that they have the potential to be active for what we are now calling HER2 low expressing cancers, as you discussed earlier, what we would have traditionally called HER2 negative disease and which we define as having uh, IHC 1 plus or 2 plus scores that are FISH negative and for which our currently available HER2 targeted therapies are ineffective. I think the best example of this is the HER2 antibody drug conjugate trastuzumab directs to CAN, which as we've, which is, as we've discussed already is a highly potent, it's a highly potent cytotoxic payload and has the potential for a bystander effect such that we are seeing activity with this agent across a broad range of HER2 expressing tumor types as shown here. But most importantly, we are seeing activity in HER2 low expressing breast cancers. This is a waterfall from a waterfall plot from a phase one trial of TDXD in heavily pretreated HER2 low, that's one plus and two plus breast cancers, and shows a response rate that's far greater than what we would achieve with standard therapy in the setting. So it's pretty exciting early results. It was the, based on the strength of that phase one data that a randomized phase three trial of HER2, uh, of, of TDXD for HER2 low metastatic breast cancer was undertaken, and patients were randomized to either TDXD or standard of care chemo. This study is actually fully enrolled, and we hope to hear some early results later this year. There is actually a second HER2 ADC called SYD985 or trastuzumab duocarmazine, which has a DNA alkylating agent as its payload, which can also exert the bystander effect. And it too has shown some promising results in HER2 positive and HER2 low expressing breast cancers as shown here. And we await results from this trial, uh, a phase three trial uh, later this year. One of the other promising areas of expansion is the use of HER2 targeted therapies for HER2 mutated cancers. Now, HER2 mutations exist in a broad range of cancers, often at low rates and at a variety of different sites. Uh, for example, in traditionally defined ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer, we see rates of HER2 mutations ranging from 2 to 10%. Now, the Summit Basket trial enrolled patients with a variety of tumors with HER2 mutations and treated these patients with neratinib, the pan HER family tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And this is the waterfall plot for the metastatic breast cancer cohort and shows a very promising and durable response for this HER2 targeted therapy in these HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer patients. Of course, we also saw a similar approach used successfully in HER2 mutated lung cancer earlier. So some very exciting, I think, potential to expand HER2 targeted therapies to a whole new group of HER2 negative patients in the future. Um, Finally, there's always interest in discovering new targets for targeted therapy, and trope 2 is another one such target. It's a transmembrane glycoprotein that's highly expressed on several solid tumors, so it has also been a therapeutic target. And we've seen the successful development and approval of the first trope 2 targeting antibody drug conjugate called sesotuzumab govitecan this past year for triple negative breast cancer. And there is another such trope 2 targeting ADC in development, datopotamab deruxtecan, and for the treatment of multiple tumors that express trope 2, including lung and breast cancer.
So I think that concludes, I think, our main session uh, for this presentation. What I'd like to do is, is uh, look at some of the questions that have been coming in from the audience. Um, now, some of these we've actually addressed, uh, I think, during, during this, just this previous session. There was a question here about uh, the use of HER2 agents for HER2 low expressing cancers. And again, nothing currently approved, but a lot of interest in this group of patients and, and trials underway. Uh, also, again, uh, the one of one of the I think uh, other questions that came up was uh, a question about HER3 and and when is HER3 testing indicated and what are the potential methods of testing? So, Kurt, maybe I can ask you to address that question. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So, so I think at, at this point there are multiple ways of testing for HER3. Essentially, the same methods that can be used for HER2, but there is no standardized re testing and reporting. Uh, I think at this point in the clinic, most of the people um, are using next generation sequencing and, and HER2, HER3 amplifications and, and mutations can, can appear, but there is no standardized testing or algorithm as we have for HER2. So uh, let me pick another question now from the audience uh, to, to um, essentially to you, um, Shanu. And, and one question that I think is of high interest is what is the current role of HER2 testing in other cancers that are not the typical breast um, GI or, or, or some of the others that we have discussed. What about things like prostate cancer or other tumors? Um, do you have any thoughts about that? So there, you know, it's a good question. I mean, we sort of addressed this a little bit earlier. I mean, we are seeing activity uh, for HER2 therapies in, in some other non-breast and gastric tumor types. There is certainly overexpression of HER2 in prostate cancer. Uh, and in fact, many cancers that we didn't discuss today However, we haven't always seen success with HER2 targeted ther therapies in these cases. And I think thus far, that's the situation for prostate cancer where we haven't seen any benefit with drugs like trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And so there are no approved therapies for these patients. There are likely several, several reasons why this may be, I think, including first and foremost, that HER2 may not be the driver in these cancers, even though it's present. It's, it's present. I mean, we see a strong correlation between gene amplification and expression in breast cancer, and breast cancer is highly susceptible to HER2 therapies. Now, in prostate cancer, amplification is a rare event, so maybe the target is just not that important in this cancer. I think, alternatively, we may not be achieving sufficient target inhibition in these cases at the doses that we use for our, our agents, or that the level of inhibition required is greater in one cancer type compared to another. And finally, something you alluded to earlier, perhaps there are other mutations that render these cancers insensitive to the current HER2 drugs we have available today. For example, we talked about earlier in colorectal cancer, only the RAS wild type patients responded to HER2 inhibition. So I think overall, while there is no role for HER2 targeted therapy in prostate cancer today, uh, but as you've seen, there are some very potent and novel agents in the pipeline. And so I think the door is still open to evaluate new therapies and novel approaches uh, that incorporate HER2 inhibition for these cancers in the future. So, so there's another question here, Kurt. Maybe I can ask you to address this for the audience member. Can you please give simplified methodology for HER2 and HER3 testing in paraffin embedded tumor tissue core biopsies to be performed together on one slide with different colors? Yeah, so that's a great question that a lot of people are trying to address. Um, there is always this idea that staining multiple markers in the same tissue saves tissue and also enhances interpretation. At this point, there is no approved test to be able to measure simultaneously HER2 and HER3. And there are some questions about the potential uh, technical details about that, because these molecules that are maybe in close proximity, even uh, dimerizing, they may have staring hindrance problems and they may affect the cross detection. Uh, so again, uh, it's not a completely resolved topic, um, uh, at least using uh, immunohistochemistry. Uh, and it is a partially resolved topic when we think about those doing next-gen sequencing panels where the, the both markers are generally included. Uh, but at this point, we don't have um, a fluorescence-based or a chromogenic staining-based assay that can simultaneously stain and score both. So um, I'll, I'll have a, um, another question uh, uh, for you, um, Shannon, relative to some clinical aspect. Uh, can you expand a little bit on what is the current meaning and handling of uh, HER2 mutations detected? 
Sure. So, I mean, we just briefly touched upon this already, but, but, you know, HER2 mutations, uh, do, do happen in, in breast cancer, of course. And, um, you know, we see them at a rate of a few, two to four or five percent in our, uh, HER2 negative breast cancer population. And, and currently there's a lot of interest in targeting uh, these, these mutant cancers. Um, and what seems to be most effective is, uh, are the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And so the, this, this was really the focus of the summit trial that we discussed, um, where they're looking at using these HER2 targeted agents, uh, in these HER2 negative cancers that have HER2 mutations. And so far, there's been some very exciting, I think, preliminary results. What we've learned is that we can, um, get a great response from this, this HER2 targeted therapy. Um, but it's not been very durable. And so what we've uh, uncovered is that using combinations of agents like a HER2 targeted agent with an anti-estrogen therapy together, uh, as these are ear positive HER2 mutant cancers, we're seeing much improved uh, and longer durations of benefits. So in fact, the study has been um, modified already to include combination therapies uh, and I think ultimately that's what's going to um, evolve as as a strategy for targeting HER2, these mutated HER2 receptors in, in a subgroup of HER2 positive or, or HER2 uh, expressing breast cancers. Um, let me pick another question for you. Uh, there's a question here. Why is cytoplasmic or non-membranous staining? For HER2 testing, sometimes used, and, and do results show actual staining of HER2 protein, or is non-specific labeling occurring? Yeah, this is a, a great question, um, and, and the, I think the technical um, considerations are that um, we don't expect uh, HER2 antibodies to bind non-specifically to other proteins, but this could happen. Um, so it could be that in some cases there is slight background staining that is not HER2. However, in the majority of cases, we don't have reasons to believe that the staining is false. Uh, and if you think about it, some pr proteins to reach to the membrane, then they have to go to the cytoplasm. So they may be in the cytoplasm. The clinical reason why most of the cytoplasmic staining is not considered is because many of the drugs, trastuzumab to start with, they bind the extracellular domain. So they need to recognize a protein in the surface to be able to have the full potential of mechanism of action. Um, so essentially, that's the reason why the cytoplasmic stain is not scored, it's not scored, and in the majority of cases, we believe uh, it could be HER2 or not, uh, but it might not be uh, biologically meaningful. So I have another question uh, for you, Shano, uh, relative to what do you think would be today the best use of circulating tumor DNA, considering that there are two uh, ctDNA panels approved by the FDA, and how would be the best use for um, diagnosing patients, monitoring patients, how to come around that? Uh, so, I mean, look, that's a, that's a really exciting field. ctDNA has, I think, um, I think captured all of us with, with you know, a lot of excitement uh, at the potential of what it can be used for. Um, currently, yes, there are, there are an approved ctDNA technologies. And for the most part, these are approved and being used in our advanced stage setting. So not for diagnosis, uh, and, and not for follow up in the curative setting. Um, that's still an area where the tools are being, re, you know, heavily tested in, in a research setting. Um, but currently we use ctDNA to follow patients, uh, who have me metastatic disease to look for how these tumors evolve, uh, what mutations may develop for which we have targeted therapies. For example, in breast cancer, uh, PI3 kinase mutations, uh, can be detected in the ctDNA, of course, and that could open up an avenue of, of PI3 kinase inhibitor therapy, uh, for patients. Um, similarly, you know, if we detect an ESR1 mutation, for example, that may lead us to move away from aromatase inhibitors, uh, which do not work well with ESR mutation, mutated cancers, and perhaps choose a, a serum estrogen or receptor de degrader or a SERD. Uh, for that patient, uh, as an alternative. So not quite, we're not quite at the, at the point where we're using these to diagnose our cancer patients, but certainly to guide some of the therapy and monitor therapy for patients in the metastatic setting. But, but something that we're, we're really excited about for the future. Yeah, I was also thinking, you know, about the hope that the circulating tumor DNA could help with the heterogeneity problem. Because at least in theory, it collects 
um, signal from multiple lesions and potentially multiple cells at the same time. So this is also um, an interesting uh, future question to address. Yeah, I agree fully. So listen, I think at this point, let's um, move move on and and uh, you know end with some take home messages and closing statements. I mean, I think from a clinician's perspective, this has been a very exciting year, past year for HER2 positive breast cancer. As I said, we saw a number of new targeted therapies uh, become available for our advanced stage patients. I think as we as we think about the future and what still needs to be done, I, I do think the ultimate goal is that we want to learn how to use these novel and effective therapies to their maximum potential, not just based on line of treatment, but rather more precisely on a better understanding of why the cancer has progressed and how to use treatment strategically to overcome resistance mechanisms and recapture control. All of this, of course, relies fundamentally on the most accurate pathological assessment, me, assessment of our biomarkers. And I think the pace of discovery uh, and the advances that we're already seeing and from, from the recent years does make me feel optimistic for the future. And I think with that, we will conclude this, this session and presentation. And I want to thank all of you for attending uh, this workshop and seminar today and thank my co-host, Kurt Schelper, um, and, and, and thank you again for, for um, your questions. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash FFU860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Daiichi Sankyo Incorporated, and Puma Biotechnology Incorporated.